Good afternoon. It is day six of the new government led by President Irfan Ali. And as promised, we have hit the road running from day one to address the major problems that confront our country. The COVID-19 pandemic, which was woefully managed, and the grievous state of the economy. These are two of primary concerns for President Irfan Ali and his government. As you know, our government ministers have been settling into their ministries and we have streamlined and reduced the number of ministries um, than what was or, uh, under the government before. And so all the ministers are in place except the one and that uh, they are settling into their ministries, getting to know what is going on and everyone is busy having briefing sessions and familiarization Today we'll have our first cabinet meeting as the new government and this is where some major decisions I'm sure will be made uh, to allow for uh, expediting the transition um, of our government. From day one the president has had meetings. Um, as you know we use a uh, convention center. We had meetings in relation to COVID-19, the discipline services, the diplomatic core and the private sector. And I could let you into a secret that uh, Mr. President has been having meetings and uh, trying to resolve issues every day until late at night and starting again early in the morning. So we're busy trying to, one, handle the transition and getting our government established. We're also trying to confront some major issues that I identified. To help us do some of the assessments of how bad or good things are in this country. We have established a rapid assessment team who are working pro bono because I saw some questions in the social media about how much they were being paid and and what was the selection process and was this tendered etc etc. Um, Mr. Wishitari they're working pro bono and as it said it's a rapid assessment team to give the president in the shortest possible time an assessment of key state agencies, and I'm sure you, the viewers, know that one of the key ones, of course, is NISL, where a lot of state assets have been transferred, have been purchased in the period since the no-confidence motion and even during the period uh, of the five months waiting for the election results. So we want a rapid assessment. And so this is not an audit. Certainly if it's an audit, it's a different process. This is just to present to the government and the president a quick overview of the state of these critical agencies in government. As it says, what more clearer language can one use than rapid assessment? We've noted the statement made today by former president Mr. Granger in his, uh, wearing his cap as leader of the People's National Congress. Some of his language is disturbing and I don't believe should be taken lightly. He warns the PPP to desist from this pattern of aggression and warned of consequences. What he talked called a pattern of aggression is in relation to what he calls a witch hunt, etc. And people being dismissed and treated badly. And in fact, uh, exaggerating and misinforming the public. First of all, Mr. Granger, as usual, seems to have not moved from his earlier position of not being properly informed by his, those who are around him. It's regrettable because as a former president, I'm sure that he'd want to know the facts. The comments this morning are disturbing and those of which we cannot leave hanging. It is one thing to have the various leaders of the coalition go to the social media and attack and use words as witch hunting and so on. But it's another thing when the former president of Guyana uh, comes with this similar language of what we've seen in the social media. And therefore, we have to respond. First of all, let me make it clear. No one has been terminated or fired. No one has received a letter terminating or, or firing them. As you well know, ministers automatically lose their jobs when a government changes. And so on August the 2nd, 
when the results were declared at that time in the afternoon, ministers no longer had a job. And as per norm in parliamentary democracies, ministers vacate their residence. I'm sure you've seen on British television, uh, number 10 Downing Street, when the elections are held in, in Great Britain. And the prime minister, even before the results, knows be, that he's lost. And he walks out, he leaves. And the new guy walks in, in a matter of, you know, an hour or a day. This is what is considered honorable, decent, dignified, and democratic. And so what we have seen here is that, yes, ministers are no longer ministers of the APNU AFC government. We know that they have vacated their offices and that they are expected to hand over state property and state assets, cars, offices, residents, and other properties. Mr. Granger particularly points out with regard to the Amerindian, what he calls the Amerindian ministers. I wish to inform the Mr. Granger in particular in speaking today that two of the Amerindian ministers who do not live in Georgetown have been given one month to vacate the government quarters that they occupy. The third minister has, uh, lives in Georgetown. There has been no request by any former minister to have any discussion about whether they need more time. However, it is normal practice if you're in a government quarters, you leave as urgently as possible when you no longer hold the position of minister. And that goes for political appointees as well. But I do wish to comment and make a comment about the fact of the time period. In May 2015, the elections were May the 11th, and I think Mr. Granger was sworn in on May the 16th. By the morning of uh, the 16th, the ministers had moved out from their offices. Their vehicles started being handing in by the Sunday, Monday, and that is how we did it. And I, I hear the indignation in Mr. Granger's voice. However, he didn't seem to have that same indignation as president when the former Minister of Housing and Water, Mr. Irfan Ali, was unceremoniously locked out of his office uh, after the swearing-in of Mr. Granger. And he could not get in to even get his personal belongings that were left in his office. Isn't it ironic that that is the person now who is the president of our nation? But Mr. Granger felt no concern about any form of of bad treatment when ministers, that minister was locked out and actually, as I said, prevented from uh, uplifting his personal belongings that were in that room. <coughs> we have also the treatment of former Prime Minister Sam Hines and Mrs. Hines when in the handover takeover of State House, uh, the Prime Minister's residence, beg pardon. I'm not doing these things to, to throw shadow on Mr. Granger's comments. I'm just saying that in 2015, we handed over, we did not resist. We gave up the vehicles, um, telephones we were ordered to give up, hand in the telephones, the laptops, etc., and we did it. And in fact, I remember that when Prime Minister Sam Hines handed in his vehicles, he was given an old vehicle that was in bad condition. I believe it was being used in the office pool to deliver mail. And that that vehicle broke down. And Mr. Pr Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Sam Hines, was stuck at, I think it was Border or, or Stavrick Market and had to get help to call someone to take him home. So we don't want to do this to ministers. We don't want this level of indignity. And therefore we expect that the ministers and the political appointees will recognize that they have to behave in a particular way at this time. We also have to remind that um, there were five months hiatus between the election and the actual declaration. And certainly if anybody felt that they had won, on June the 9th when the results were put up on the, the screens, 
of NCN showing the totals of 233,000 versus 217,000, that you'd think they'd got the message. In addition to that, there were 100 countries represented in the UN and more, representing the United Nations, Commonwealth, Organization of American States, European Union, and CARICOM. And so they all can't be wrong. And therefore, there was a period of time between June the 9th and August the 2nd to put yourself in order. Certainly, it could not go on forever. The, this issue of the political appointees, I wish to bring to your attention, as I said earlier, no political appointee has been received a letter. In some cases, they have some they are being persuaded to resign, which would be the easiest thing and most honorable thing to do. And I wish to point out that um, two persons did that. Mr. McWilfred sent in his resignation, handed over his keys, handed over his vehicle, handed over his office, and Mr. Mark Curtin both resigned and did the honorable thing. The president, former, Mr. Gra uh, former president Mr. Granger, returned his cars and was given his selection of cars uh, to take with him. And so we can do this in a, in a very honorable and uh, dignified manner. Unfortunately, there are a number of political appointees who have been advised to hand over the vehicles. They have not handed over the vehicles as yet. They've been advised to vacate the premises that are paid for by the taxpayers. They have not done so. And so <coughs> the, we are not the ones looking for a fight. In fact, it is those who don't want to give up that are looking for a fight. So Mr. Green should take note, tell your tell your appointees that came under your government to behave in an honorable way and do as you did, hand over. But if they're looking as if it's the bully boy, this is bully boy season still, because bullyism ended on August the 2nd when the results were declared. And we'd had enough of five months of bullyism and torture. And so I find it rather amusing that the former president will speak about decency and use loaded words as witch hunt and threaten uh, consequences. But I do, want to, I do want to say this, that we have found out <coughs> that there are many political appointees in almost every ministry. So from the Office of the President, we are handling those and managing and looking at how to address the political appointees that are here in the Office of the President. However, there are political appointees in almost every sector. Letters have gone out too. So whilst we have not dismissed people and terminated people, and we've tried to persuade them a week later to resign, that we have asked people to remove from government residences they occupy, and which are paid for by the taxpayers. And of course, there's a new government coming in, so we do need quarters as well. We also have ministers who don't live in Georgetown and who would have to be accommodated. All the ministries, as I said, are stacked with political appointees as advisors, special project officers, heads of departments that don't exist. Some have, even, have, some have never been seen in some of the ministries. And we have to remember too that political appointees are there because they are hired usually by the president and his government to help him and the government or her carry out the policies and programs of that government. When that president is no longer there and that government is no longer there, the rationale, the raison d'etre for those political appointees has come to an end and therefore they have no role to play. We have understood that Ms. Carol Smith-Joseph is, an, an, uh, has a, is an, advise, an advisory position in the Ministry of Natural Resources. Well, we all know the role Ms. Joseph played during the elections and post-elections and the recount 
and all the way through. Mr. Ronald Barker, right here the officer president, is accounting agent, was accounting agent for the APN UFC. And we know that he was very active and did the work for his party well. We have no problem with him working for his party well, that's his political duty. However, we do have a problem with him se seeming, to, seeming to believe that he does not have to hand over his office, does not have to hand over his vehicle, and does not have to move out of government quarters. Mrs. Chandon Edwards was every day at the recount, and we know her role in trying to influence the chairperson of the GCOM. She also has not abided and followed the example of former president, Mr. Granger. Ironically, Harman and Chan Chandan have both asked for 42 days leave starting Monday on. And so we are kind of surprised by this. Is this a sign that they wish to serve under the People's Progressive Party government? Um, rather strange that in the midst of all this, uh, they won't leave. We have heard the accusations of calling the PPC a cabinet that is a hodgepodge of misfits. Um, we are not in any way bothered by these uh, name calling because what we do know is that the cabinet of the People's Progressive Party, led by uh, Dr. Irfan Ali as president, is younger, more energetic, more qualified and uh, moving at a pace that I don't think the former government was able to achieve in five years, what we are doing now in a matter of six days. So we're not daunted by this name calling. There's also an issue that was raised, I believe, in Mr. Granger's comment about um, a statement that Minister Barrett made in relation to being bankrupt. Just again for the public to know, when we left office in 2015, the Guyana Forestry Commission had $4 billion surplus. Today it is bankrupt. It cannot pay the staff. It did not pay the staff in July because it didn't have money. There's hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. And so <coughs> we have no apologies to make for bringing to the public's attention what is happening to our country and what has happened to our country. How could $4 billion just disappear in a ministry which brings in revenue all the time? You are all aware of the Lillian Dahl Hospital scandal, and the scandal gets deeper and wider with every day. And so we are not going to be preached to by those whose record is now up to for examination and will be examined, I'm sure, by the auditors in great depth. But we have to also make sure that we as the new government are protecting our people. Our concern for the workers of this country and the employees, we have set up as requested by the Trade Union Congress and the last May Day, uh, the May Day rally of 2018, I believe, to have a Ministry of Labour. And that shows that we are concerned about the condition of workers and employees. We are not, our concerns as a government re relate, relate to the issue of political appointees, who are particularly those who are not cooperating. We have, and you know, many of the political appointees who have been going on television and social media who are actually hired and paid for by the taxpayers in attacking Mr. President Ali's government up to recently. So although the government has changed, although they know as political appointees they're supposed to leave their offices, their vehicles and their residences, they continue to attack the government and then have now the protection of Mr. Granger, that somehow they are righteous in what they're doing. Well, they're not righteous in what they're doing. There, there is what is standard, what they call standard operating protocol in parliamentary democracies. And that is when a government change and your political appointees, no matter what your name is, you step out.
gracefully, you collect your benefits, you collect what you are entitled to, and you wait for the next election. That's how it works. And so that's what we want our country to be, a mature parliamentary democracy. So we want to uh, assure our people, all our people, because I know that the campaign on the social media uh, to do with witch hunt and somebody put up a list of people going to be fired, what was called a blacklist and so on, I want to assure Guyanese that we are not here to take away food from people most. We are not here to take public servants who have been working hard in the system. We are not dealing with the public servants, whether they're cooks or drivers or secretaries or clerks. If they're political appointees in the system, as I've said, then we are asking them to resign. And if they do not, they will be getting letters of termination. We are not going to be bullied, but at the same time we've given them a week to do what is right. And from Monday, things may, they will receive letters. So I want to say to the public, stay calm, do not uh, let anybody intimidate you. These uh, threats of, uh, uh, from Mr. Granger do not in any way um, phase us, do not frighten us, do not intimidate us. We believe that we have, we can change this country and put the country back on the road as quickly as possible. Thank you very much.